Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Meyer, music director of the Erie Philharmonic, and it is my great pleasure to be with you for another edition of Coffee Talk. And it's our opportunity to get to talk about the people behind the music that we make here at the Erie Philharmonic. And I want to introduce you to our executive director, Steve Weiser, who's with us today, and also Dr. Gene Snyder, who is one of the foremost scholars of the life of Harry T. Burley, and baritone Eddie Pleasant, who is a wonderful uh, vocalist and singer who has collaborated with the Erie Philharmonic on a number of occasions. And we were just saying before this that uh, I've never actually had the chance to meet Eddie, so uh, this is a, a good opportunity for me to get, get to know him a little bit better. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here for Coffee Talk. Um, this is a special time for us at the Philharmonic because, as you know, we've been recording our concerts and we've been broadcasting them on WQLN PBS rather than holding live concerts uh, in the Warner Theater, which is our, our regular home. And I thought this might be a good opportunity for us to record and to investigate some music that we wouldn't potentially actually perform on our main stage series at the Warner. And this upcoming concert is all about American music, music that was conceived of or written here in the United States, even if not all of the composers were American born. Um, but perhaps the most important composer on this program coming up is an Erie native. And of course, that's the great Harry T. Burley. And I thought we might start with, with Eugene. I know you have devoted a good portion of your, your scholarly life anyway to, to the life of this uh, amazing man and this amazing musician. Can you give us a little background about, about Harry, particularly just um, the very beginnings and, and his life here in, in Erie, PA? Right. Um, Burley was a third generation free man. Uh, his grandfather purchased his freedom in 1832. And then uh, after he met his wife in uh, near Ithaca, New York, came to Erie in 1838, where Burley's mother was born. Well, actually, she was born in, in uh, New York, but soon after that, they moved to Erie. Um, <clears throat> Burley was the third son of his parents. Henry Thacker Burley was his father who was a Civil, uh, Civil War Navy veteran. Um, and Burley's mother had studied at Avery College in Pittsburgh, uh, graduated as a, as a teenager in 1855, and she gave an essay in French uh, at her graduation. Um, she was very well, that was a classical curriculum. She was very well trained. And uh, so Burley grew up in a home that really valued education and that was very musical. Uh, Burley's father died when he was only seven years old, um, but she married another Civil War veteran, John Elmendorf, uh, several years later. And uh, the stories that Burley told of singing with his mother as she worked and his, grand and his actually his stepfather, they would all sing together at, the, at their work. Burley became known as a singer when he was still in, in high school and Actually, he went to high school in his late teens. And by the time before he left Erie at the age of 25, he was singing all over Erie. He was well known, singing with the best classical singers in town uh, and singing in Cleveland and Buffalo and uh, other places. And the list, I was just looking through the list of churches and, and, and civic events where he sang before he left. He was all over town. Uh, and was regarded as one of the, the best singers. Um, he, in January of 18, 1892, he went to New York City to audition for a scholarship at, uh, for the artist's course at the National Conservatory of Music. Now, there were several courses. This one was to pre prepare professional musicians to have a career in music. Um, he didn't quite make it in his first audition, but um, the registrar, Frances McDowell, the mother of the composer Edward McDowell, was the registrar, and it was she who gave him the word that he hadn't quite, that he hadn't quite uh, passed. Uh, Burley recognized her because years before, she had been the traveling companion of the fiery Venezuelan pianist Teresa Carreño, who performed in uh, Elizabeth Russell's home in Erie and Burley had been the doorman for that concert. So he recognized this kind-faced lady. And so he asked her, he told her uh, of his wish to, to, and his 
his disappointment and his wishing. He actually had a letter from Mrs. Russell that he pulled out. And uh, <clears throat> the story is that, sh that Mrs. Uh, <clears throat> McDowell. McDowell, thank you. Mrs. McDowell was able to arrange a, a second audition. Actually, probably one reason he didn't quite make it the first time is that on that audition committee was Rafael Josefi, the Hungarian pianist, a friend of Liszt, whom he had stood outside the window to hear play uh, before. Imagine singing. I mean, he was well known and he was not a, an amateur performer, but to sing before Rafael Josefi. Uh, <laughs> so he had a second chance and he was one, he was awarded one of the four, one of the four scholarships. There were 200 people that were competing for this. He was awarded one of the four scholarships uh, for the artists course at the conservat at the National Conservatory of Music. Now, and Jean, in terms of the status of the National Conservatory, was this um, kind of a precursor to the Juilliard School or um, it, where did that stand in terms of, of music education in, in the United States at the time? It actually was in the forefront, but um, it do, did not become, uh, it was actually a uh, Frank, um, sorry, my brain is letting me down. Um, Frank Damrosch's uh, Musical Institute that became uh, Juilliard. But, um, but the National Conservatory lasted into the 1930s and it, the curriculum actually set a model. For example, everyone had to learn solfege. Uh, they also, it was, a, it was a liberal arts college. They had to study history of music, everybody, especially the performers. So it actually set a pattern that became standard for music conservatories later on. Uh, it actually began because Jeanette Thurber thought that American, she had studied the, at the Paris Conservatory and uh, she knew that in Paris, in, in France, the best, any student who was gifted could study uh, whether they could pay or not. And she thought that should happen in the United States and that American singers, American musicians should not have to go to Europe to learn to, to get the best music education. But she wanted an opera company. And she founded an opera company, which was very successful, but could not be sustained financially. And they had a very successful first tour, but it was, a, uh, it was very expensive. And, this, and this, they went broke in their second, in their second year wow. in 1886. So it became uh, a music conservatory which had several different tracks, including a track for amateurs who just wanted to learn to learn about music and become and become educated audience and supporters, which is a great idea, I think. And we we need that. We need that. Uh, that there's no point in performing all this beautiful music if there, if there's nobody out there listening to it. It's, it's a market. It's a, it's a it's its own ecosystem. Right. right. Speaking of ecosystem, Eddie, tell us a little bit about your. Um, your upbringing and, and, and your background. Do you remember a point at which you fell in love with, with singing classical music or, or were you singing in church side by side? Or where, 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 was, that, um, where was that connection made between uh, the repertoire that you sing now? Um, listen, I grew up in a, in a musical family uh, and, and, a, and a, 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 a home filled with music. And uh, to this day, it, it, it boggles my mind that um, People don't listen to all kinds of music as I did growing up. Um, uh, we had a piano in the house. Many homes had a piano. It was the entertainment center uh, of the home. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember uh, learning to play My Country Tis of Thee with this one finger. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Eddie technique. Uh, and my parents grew up listening to big band. Um, I had older siblings that listened to Motown. But then there were those amazing uh, broadcasts on the radio on Saturdays, where there were symphonies and the, and the Metropolitan Opera. And so I think early on, I began to um, uh, absorb all of these, uh, all of these sounds, all of these musics, and they and they everything connected with me. And and to this day, it's all the same to me. I can be listening to Charlie Pride, if you know who he is, sure, Johnny Cash, and all of those people. But then turn around and listen to uh, Luciano pa Pavarotti. You know, uh, it, it was just all the same to me. 
um, one of my favorite uh, memories is uh, there was a, a lady down the street from us, uh, across the street and several houses down, named Helen Sherrod. And she had this huge upright piano in her, in her living room. And she had one of those louvered screen doors where you couldn't see in, but it was just a, 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 a series of louvered, you know, of louvers. And I remember going outside as a child and hearing her, she, she sang in the Baptist church and I heard her singing and I was just drawn to this sound and my ears followed that sound over until I was looking at this huge speaker. <laughs> that seemed like a speaker and obviously Helen was inside and I would knock on the door and she would say, come on in baby. And, you know, and, and let me, um, allow me to watch her practice because, you know, she loved what she was singing. My connection to this music is organic. As an African American, I was taught these, uh, songs through the oral tradition. I remember my mother singing these songs singing Go Down Moses, singing um, Follow the Drinking Gourd, singing uh, My Lord, What a Morning. That's how I learned those songs. And that's how those songs were, were passed. And thank goodness for Burley, who took it out of our oral tradition and preserved them by writing them down. And I think that's such an important point you make there, Eddie, because uh, for a long time, it was only existing in the oral tradition. Yes. And then it took someone like Burley to, A, recognize their value historically yes. and as, yes. as literature, but B, to give them such an artful treatment. They're so beautifully rendered. I mean, you know, volume full of, of spirituals that, that, you know, even I as a boy, I remember when I was in high school, among my, among my first voice lessons, I was assigned a Harry T. Burley spiritual arrangement. Yes. And yeah. What was it? What was the song? I honestly don't remember what the, what the <laughs> spiritual was, but I, I do remember the name Harry T. Burley. And I was so excited <laughs> once I learned that he was from Erie because I, you know, I finally made that connection. I didn't realize that he was famous and he, right. he it's incredibly right. important to, to America, American music history. Yes. I um, mean, well, one of the things that people don't realize is that Burley's first fame, beyond being a singer, was as an art song composer. Mm. And so he had, he had published many, many art songs, and they were sung by an amazing roster of the most famous Afri uh, American and European recital and opera singers. And John, John McCormick was one of them. He, he sang at least 27 of Burley's art songs, and he premiered many of them. He was, mm -hmm. he was a good friend. And, and many of the other most famous opera and recital singers were singing his art songs. So when in the 1916-1917 recital season, he began publishing these art song arrangements of spirituals, they were ready for them. They couldn't, you know, they immediately added them to their repertoire because they were already singing his, mm -hmm. his art songs. Um, not all of them, <laughs> and some of them didn't know he was black until, and so they didn't want to sing them. <laughs> but but there were plenty who did, uh, and so uh, you know it's important to remember the art song tradition that Burley contributed to. He's the first African American composer to publish a substantial catalog of art songs that are really wonderful. So, and what an interesting to, time to uh, to what an interesting time to to yeah. be an educated black person right. in the mid to late 19th century right. on into the 20th century. Yeah. And uh, many people had a certain idea about people of color and what they could and could not do. Menstrual seat and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. Exactly. And you have these people that are breaking paradigms in, in people's expectations. Mm -hmm. Yet within the, the black community, they're thinking, yes, of course I can do this math problem. <laughs> and of course, I can figure out that tomatoes won't make you ill or kill you. Thank you, Dr. George Washington Carver. And that peanuts taste good. You know? And you can rotate your crops. And you can write an art song. Right. You know? So I'm sure, but and it makes me wonder how they navigated that interesting world of the old versus the new. Yeah, that was my question. My next question is, is what kind of impact this have or what kind of roadblocks did, did Burley run into um, in trying to develop a career? Well, he was, 
You know, actually, his years at the conservatory, and we have to mention that Burley arrived in January, but in se late September, the new director of the National Conservatory came, and his name was Antonin Dvorak. Um, Jeanette Thurber persuaded Dvorak to come because she wanted American composers to understand how they could draw on, they could create American music, drawing on the folk music of America, which would be African-American and Native American. Um, and American composers had played around with that a little bit, but hadn't really taken it seriously. Dvorak had used Czech uh, Bohemian music, folk songs, dances in his, in his, in his compositions. So she knew he could, he could help American composers to do that. And uh, when Dvorak heard Burley sing, he invited him to the, the apartment where he lived with his family. And Burley would have dinner and then he would sit down at the Steinway piano, <laughs> uh, loaned by William Steinway, and sing the songs that he'd learned from his grandfather who'd been a slave. And, Dvor and Dvorak would say, is it, stop him and say, is that really the way the slaves sang it? Uh, and he <laughs> had, he had um, cages of birds. Dvorak loved birds. And so he had cages of thrushes. He would open up the cages and the birds would fly around and join in the singing. <laughs> A great, great picture. Um, so Dvorak heard and he listened so carefully. And Dvorak, Burley also said, Dvorak asked hundreds of questions about the lives of the people that created this music. He wasn't just interested, he was interested in the music, but he wanted to know about the people who had actually created this music. Um, and so, um, he actually began composing his symphony from the New World that, that next year in, in, uh, the er, in early 1893 uh, at the time that Burley was singing. Now that one of the remarkable things about Burley's symphony is that theme from the second movement, the Largo theme. And there are a lot of people that think it was a spiritual Fortunately, we have the record of one of Dvorak's composition students who, who, for whom uh, Dvorak played the whole symphony as he was writing it. And Camille Zekwer recorded, uh, reported in an article in Etude magazine how 20 minutes after Dvorak had written that melody, he came in and played it at the piano, his whole body vibrating, and he said, is it not beautiful music? It is for my symphony, but it is not symphonic music. It has become a spiritual. Mm -hmm. Forty-one years later, another one of his, uh, another one of Dvorak's uh, composition students, William Arms Fisher, wrote the words uh, that we now know, and people think it, you know, it has really become a spiritual. It's become, entered into the folk music of America, mm -hmm. but it started out uh, as a product of Dvorak's listening so carefully to what Burley sang for him. And of course, we're talking about the the, the, the going home theme. Yeah, going home, of course. I couldn't think. Of the title. Right. Yes. Yeah, going home. Yeah, and and you're right. Everybody thinks that that he started with a spiritual and then just kind of uh, created a symphonic arrangement. But uh, oddly enough, it's just the other way around. But he he absorbed obviously what uh, what Burley had sung for him. Yes. Over, over those occasions, and and so inhabited it that he, right. he was able to to, to spill mm -hmm. it out as as if it was an authentic spiritual. He absorbed, he absorbed the language yeah. of the music. Uh, and I, and I, I gave him full credit for that. Uh, just as George Gershwin did for Porgy and Bess, there are some things in, that, in the opera that sound as though they are spirituals, but no, he, George absorbed it so well and got the flavor in it and made something completely new, but in the genre. And there's another example of that in his string quartet, which is now called the American String Quartet. Nathaniel Dett, uh, who was born in Canada, uh, born in Niagara Falls, um, became an African-American composer. When he heard the second movement, they reminded him of the songs he'd heard his grandmother sing. And he, it helped to, he, he decided that he needed to give his life to working with those, with those songs. So, you know, uh, it's another great example of how Dvorak absorbed and then represented what he heard from Burley. There has to be something in the in the chemistry of the uh, of the of the intervals 
Mm -hmm. and the rise and the fall of the notes that somehow, it, I, I don't want to say magic, there's, there's got to be a reason why those type tunes, like, like all, the, all the hymns and songs in the pentatonic scale, there's mm -hmm. something about the combination of, of, of notes and, and, and the intervals and things of how those melodies are constructed that somehow really touch us. And also the bending of notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, those, those, uh, you know, the, the, the lower seventh and so on uh, that, that are part of that tradition mm -hmm. that, keep, that keep showing up. Yeah. Steve, I would put you on the spot and, hear, and ask you what you think the importance is of knowing that Burley came from Erie and that, that he uh, has such a, a strong tie to, to our community. I mean, I think you set me up for a story without even knowing about it, um, which is fascinating. Um, growing up as a kid in a music school at Temple, New World Symphony, especially the second movement, was just a favorite piece of music of mine at a sort of very growing time in my life. And Largo, that second movement, will always be just very special for me. So when I had to come up with a project as part of a job interview to come work for the chamber orchestra, I, unbeknownst, had read in Symphony Magazine about Joe Horowitz's new special concert about New World Symphony and connecting it to Burley. I'm like, oh, wow, this is like a multimedia orchestra thing, but I hadn't read the book ahead of time. So I emulated this project. I'm like, all right, we're going to take my favorite piece of music. And I sat down in my job interview and like, all right, now get this. We're going to do this incredible thing. We're going to talk about New World Symphony. And we're going to pair it with the music of Harry Burley and show how this music inspired this. And the people in my interview were like, oh, my God, that's such a good idea, Burley from Erie. Like, I know. <laughs> and I just, I, I know. <laughs> And they're like, there's a school here called Pfeiffer Burley. And you're like, right. So I feel like for me, I was like, I, I went to music school. Like I went through the whole sh shebang with it. And I had to find out about that in such a backwards way. And I feel like I would love to see that even just come more into the forefront, like with what we're doing, with other different programs to showcase that here's this piece of music that we've all studied and we all know a thousand times, but did you know that without Erie and Burley, it probably wouldn't sound like it did. And I, I'd love to see that grow. And especially <laughs> living it personally. So. Yeah, yeah. There's another little uh, tidbit that I'd like to interject. Burley's son s said that Burley developed these spiritual arrangements in the 15 years that he was traveling with Booker T. Washington to when Bo Washington would come, no come north to raise money for Tuskegee. And he, uh, beginning in 1900, began asking Burley to come with him. Burley's singing would open the purse strings. And it was, and, and Alston Burley, Burley's son, said it was in those performances in hotels and, you know, um, that he developed these, these uh, spiritual arrangements. We, if only we had recordings, if only we could see, you know, see the development of that. We still need a, a really good musicologist to study the development of Burley's style of, of performance. Horace Maxwell could do a beautiful job. At, somebody has to do that. But it would be just phenomenal if we had that, that record. Uh, but, unf but speaking of the context, Af uh, educated African Americans criticized him sharply for singing those songs to white people. Yes. Yes. And there were several reasons for that. Some of them wanted to forget them because they were because they were connected to slavery. Mm -hmm. But some of them also felt they were too precious to sing for the people who had enslaved okay. them. Wow. So mm -hmm. it's a complex it's a complex story. But uh, yeah. and, and it took time to it took time to move away from that. Yeah. Uh, I I collect hymnals and uh, one of my favorite hymnals uh, is uh, the uh, two volumes of the African American spirituals uh, that was, I think, printed uh, through the uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, and and in the preface, it, it sort of stated that uh, sort of that that uncomfortable feeling uh, and the complexity of of the feelings of that music for for Black people. I, I think uh, time has helped us, and also the fact that we're you know since we've got more distanced from that, now we can appreciate them for what they are and not 
have a, without all the baggage. But I still hear some African Americans feeling that way because they don't understand. Yes. They're really protest songs. They're really protest you songs. You don't understand that. That's there, right. I, mean, I have, you know, I can, I can quote some people <laughs> who, who didn't want to hear it, who still don't want to hear about them. Right, they right. They don't really understand them. But there is, that's the very reason during the civil rights movement and even the current Black Lives Matter movement right. that yeah. we call on those weapons, if you will, yes. right. because there's nothing like music that gets into the very psyche mm -hmm. of the people. And, it, and, and the spiritual isn't just something that, that emboldens the oppressed people, but it gets into the heart of the people who are in power yeah. as well. Yeah. Bernice yeah. Johnson Reagan's wonderful video, it's Bill Moyer's video, uh, The Songs Are Free. I wish we could get it on a DVD. It's never been transferred to DVD, but it's powerful in, in speaking about that, particularly in speaking about the importance during the civil rights movement. And Bernice okay. Johnson Reagan was very much a part of that. Yes. Yeah. I think that would be such an important thing to impart on young people too. Yes. And yes. Developing musicians and, and just students studying history, American history. Mm -hmm. right. To learn that this music has a reason for its, yeah. for its existence and, and its reason for its development and its reason, frankly, for Burley wanting to encapsulate uh, as artistic a rendering as he could come up with of these. He and wanted other people who weren't African Americans to be able to sing them. Right. And at that time, the only people who could really perform them as, you know, as they were in the oral tradition were people who were African Americans. Right. right. So that leads us to our program here with the Erie Philharmonic. And um, what I decided to do is select three of my favorites mm -hmm. and put them together as a suite. And since we're in the middle of COVID, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to engage a, a singer to sing on the same stage as the musicians, which just kills me. Um, but uh, we tried the next best thing, which was to come up with a, a string arrangement of the original Harry uh, T. Burley arrangements that he made for, for solo piano and for solo singer. And uh, the three that I chose were Wait in the Water, um, Deep River, and Ride on King Jesus. Mm. And um, Eddie, uh, would you mind just giving us a little flavor of these just so that people understand um, kind of the inflection and the beauty that's built into these? Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, gonna trouble the water see that man all dressed in red god's gonna trouble the water it looks like the folks that moses led god's gonna trouble the water you gotta wait in the water Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. Gods are gonna trouble the water. Love it. That's wonderful. And Burley's arrangement really uh, capitalizes on that syncopation. Bum, bum, ba, bum, bum. And you hear, duh, duh. you hear this almost motoric rhythm in the mm -hmm. piano beneath it. It really gives us this nice forward propulsion through the whole That's thing. Right. And that interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, the next is probably a classic that, that many people know and don't even realize that maybe it's a spiritual. Um, Deep River. Deep River. My home is over Jordan, deep river, Lord. I want to cross over into camp. Wrong. 
And so Dvorak treats that like the second movement of the New World Symphony. Uh, I mean, excuse me, Burley uh, treats that like the, the, the second movement of the New World Symphony. It's just a very luscious, beautiful, slowly evolving accompaniment in the piano. And it's just a, a beautiful vehicle for, for a legato voice. Somebody um, who could just spin that line like you just did, Eddie. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> And then the third, Ride on King Jesus. What I loved about this is that it's so energetic. There's just so much power behind it. And it just, it just leaps, off the, leaps off the page, leaps off the stage. Ride on King Jesus, no man can hinder me. Ride on King Jesus, ride on. No man can hinder me. Ride, ride, ride. Bravo. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, if I really had my druthers, I would have you sing them first and then sing with the orchestra and then do them again. Just get them embedded in everyone's consciousness. I think this is such an important uh, li American literature, musical literature that everybody should know, should have some experience with, mm -hmm. and frankly, should be able to sing. Um, and right. I'm, I'm grateful that, that it's kind of seeped into um, Christian hymnals over the, over the decades. Over and I hope, that, uh, I hope that we just play a small part in preserving this incredible musical tradition and historical tradition. Mm -hmm. And Gene, I love what you brought up about it being, about them being protest songs, about them being yeah. um, truly uh, works of art in, in, in and of themselves and through this oral tradition that's passed over. And then in one moment of time, Harry T. Burley from Erie, Pennsylvania decided, I really need to turn these into art songs. I need to find some way to, to uh, create a, 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 yet another version of these artifacts so that they can exist and, and live in the realm that Schubert lives in and Beethoven lives in and all the great lead composers do. Yeah. And we don't know whether he would have fully understood that, but Dvorak said, give those melodies to the world. Mm. And that became a mandate for him and he did that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you referenced uh, the uh, Johnson, the um, James Weldon and J. Rosamund Johnson, the book of American Negro Spirituals. Those extensive forwards by James Weldon Johnson are works of art and they need to be known. And one of the things, Weldon Johnson references Burley several times and, and in the second one, I think it's the second one. He says, Burley's music played a major role. And then he goes on to say that in discovering, in rediscovering the value of the spirituals, African-Americans recovered a leaping pride in their own heritage. And he, he makes it clear that that led to the new creative movement, which we now know as the Harlem Renaissance. Burley played a major role in helping people understand the value of their own tradition. Now, by the Harlem Renaissance, there were people that were criticizing Burley for taking them too far from their, you know, their oral tradition. Mm -hmm. But the path is still very clear. Well, this is a fascinating topic. It's one that we probably need about three more episodes to, to <laughs> fully tease out. But I'm just really grateful uh, that we have had uh, three wonderful panelists with us today to share some of their experiences with this, this great music. Uh, Steve Weiser, the executive director of the Erie Philharmonic, Dr. Gene Snyder, a uh, scholar formerly on the faculty of Edinburgh University, and now uh, uh, a Pittsburgh resident, right, Gene? That's correct. Yeah, yes. welcome to town. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> actually i lived in Pitt i've lived in pittsburgh since 1984. well there you I go you should be welcoming me then because i am <laughs> <laughs> well, i'm happy to know you're here <laughs> <laughs> and then of course eddie pleasant oh what an absolute joy to get a chance to meet you and get to hear you sing and i hope it's not long where we can um just get together and share music together in person yeah <laughs> <laughs> right and so cheers to you all, and, and uh, oh, and if you want to learn more about Harry T. Burley, extraordinary American composer and performer, um, please check out, there we go, check out Dr. Jean Snyder's, she wrote the book on Harry T. Burley. It's, I have an autographed copy. 
Yeah. Well, you should have. There you go. It is the definitive biography of Harry T. Burley and, of course, talks about his years here in Erie and then, of course, talks about uh, all the great things that he did in New York City. And just tell us very briefly, Jean, what was it like at the end of his life? I know that so many people knew who he was and revered him. Tell us a little bit about that and, and how he was celebrated. Well, he was... Um, he was, people don't, many people don't realize the significance of his work as an editor at the Ricordi Music Publishing Company, which was based in Milan, Italy. It was, you know, it was a Puccini and Verdi's um, publisher. Burley was, worked in the New York office and had, and was a music editor. Uh, the story behind that, his first, one of his, his first publisher was uh, William Maxwell, whose brother George, eventually became opened the the New York office of Ricordi and hired Burley because they had such great respect for him. And Burley's, um, it was said that no no piece of music left that that office without Burley's going over it carefully because he was highly regarded as a music editor. And of course he could help to facilitate the publishing of other, uh, the music of other composers, black composers. And Jester Hairston told me that the younger composers would go to the new, to the recording office and bring their compositions to Burley to hear. And he said he always had time for us. Wow, wow. That's so amazing. you know, um, there's so many stories like that. And Daniel, I must I must apologize if I've interrupted you because I get so excited. No, not at all. This is an exciting topic, and it's one that I think that we're like like I said, we'll play a small role, but. But hopefully this this leads to a flowering of and a rediscovery right. of, of what what this incredible man meant to American music history and meant to the history of the music of the world and in particular the preservation of, of this grand tradition of, of African American spiritual. So now, at the end of his life, his 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 niece Grace Blackwell told me many stories about the end. She was very close to him in the last years of his life, and it was she who recognized when he needed to be put in care because uh, he was he was no longer mentally competent right. um, but people came to visit him and people played um i think it was the roger wagner they played for him uh and in fact um lynn foot who is the uh, co-founder and president of the burley society in new york city sure, who's yeah. now doing her doctorate in in Oxford, England, at the Oxford University, she's uncovering amazing things, and she's just discovered a phenomenal uh, event that was planned in his honor in 1948. That's a year before he died. It never, somehow, it seems not to have come off. But learning about that kind of recognition of his contribution uh, yes. to American music is just is overwhelming. It's just. So there's more to learn. There's always more to learn. <laughs> and I, uh, I happen to uh, be in Stamford, Connecticut, where, uh, Burley, where Burley died. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I would read in his uh, biography that he died at Stamford Hall, and I had no idea where that was. And so mm -hmm. I continued to dig and dig and dig. And lo and behold, I learned more about the town that I once lived in. I live in a nearby town now. But um, Stanford uh, Hall was a sort of a, sanat a sanatorium where people would go to uh, convalesce. And it was like maybe a forerunner of nursing homes and the Betty Ford Clinic and that sort of thing. So wealthy, well-to-do people would say, oh, Cousin Clarence, he's, he's on the continent in Europe. But really, he was right here in Stanford drying out. Okay. <laughs> And so, you know, and, and so I found out where Stanford Hall is. Um, it's amazing that everything that we see a hundred years ago was something completely different. It might have been undeveloped land um, or forest or whatever. And uh, Stanford Hall is now um, a, a series of office parks and things that, uh, that were developed back in the 80s. But a hundred years ago, it was a beautiful sprawling tract of land that had a river running through it oh. and it was developed by an early Stanford, Connecticut real estate um, broker and politician who later became mayor of Stanford and, the, and one of his sons became um, the mayor of Stanford in the 50s. And that land was sold in the mid 60s to the Lord and Taylor uh, Corporation 
And uh, the land where our Lord and Taylor store is, is directly overlooking what used to be Stanford Hall. And so when you write an article, Eddie, there's an article there for you. We need to know more. You, you've got, yeah. (laughs) But it's so interesting, finally bridging what was to what I know. And that was the second place where he, he was in Long Island in a place that was not caring well for him. Yes. And that's probably why he he was moved to Stanford. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so for years, here I was passing the place where Burley spent some time and of course his last moments on right. earth, you yeah. know. And so there's a church, the First United Methodist Church here in Stanford, and uh, which is directly across the street from where the uh, sanatorium was. Mm-hmm. And I would love to see an annual Burley uh, concert there, memorial indeed, concert. Indeed, indeed. Yes, yes indeed. Let's do that, yes. <laughs> Let's, let's get rid of this virus first. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah right. I, that's a good first step. And then, uh, yeah. then all these amazing plans can, can come can into play. Support. Exactly. Well, thanks to you all. It's just been an absolute thrill to get to, to talk to you and, and share some of these wonderful anecdotes about Harry Burley. And uh, looking forward to our performance of these three Burley spirituals in a beautiful string transcription by Christina Dolance, uh, eerie, uh, an eerie resident and a very creative and and wonderful composer and uh, look forward to that and all that will be broadcast on WQLN PBS coming to a public television station near you. I love it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Cheers. (laughs) Thanks guys. Thank you.